night they caught nothing. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they, now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had stripped it for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. So Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had revealed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, said to him Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show him the kind of death he was to, by which he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We gather this morning as we near the end of the Easter season, but it is also Mother's Day, so we have a double reason to celebrate this morning. And I think as we go on together, we will be able to see how the two really do fit together. You ladies who are celebrating Mother's Day, do you remember what it was like when you had your first child? It was a wonderful experience, for sure, but it wasn't easy, was it? I mean, I remember what it was like. I mean, the bag is packed, and husbands are anxious, and then that comment is made, I'm feeling a contraction. And you wait a while, and another one comes, and after a while, she says, I think I need to go to the hospital. And with excitement, the bag is put into the car and you make your way to the hospital and the delivery room nurses are full of smiles as they get you into your room and you settled in and you make all kinds of phone calls telling parents and siblings and friends, we're here at the hospital. The time has finally come. But then there is often, not always, but often a transformation that begins to take place. Somewhere along the way, the comment has been made, it hurts too much. I can't take it anymore. And then for some, the words, give me the drugs. And many a husband has said his hands grip, his wife's hand gripping his felt more like a vice than a hand. And every now and then, the comment is made, not in love, but the wife turns to her husband and said, you did this to me. And never has a man been so glad that his wife could not get up and chase him down the hallway. No, it's not like that for everyone. And all humor aside, it's a tough job. Labor is work. When a child is born, never has a woman worked so hard in her life. She is absolutely exhausted. But the moment she holds her child for the first time, it was all worth it. Because in that moment, she is changed. She becomes mother, and that's a very special role. From that point forward, it becomes who she is, her identity, and she is there for her child. 
Every time there is a cry or a skint knee, she's there to comfort and console. When a child becomes sick, mom becomes an expert nurse. She, she is there in unique ways as well. Without a spoken word, a mother knows instinctively when something is wrong, and she's there to care for her child. Now, it's not that fathers don't do this. They often do. But it is the reality that this is who a woman has become as a mother. A few years ago, a second grade teacher took a science project to school with her class. She gathered her, her children around a table, and she brought out a couple of large magnets. She showed them how they could push against each other or how they could stick together, how they could pick up metal objects. The next day, she gave the children a test. And this was a question. I have six letters, and I begin with M, and I pick things up. When the tests were turned in and she graded them, half the class had missed the question. Half the class wrote magnet, but half the class wrote mother. For you see, a mother has the unique ability even to do the most mundane of chores out of love for her children. But there's one thing every mother does struggle with, and that is the reality of letting her children go, letting them spread their wings and learn what it means to live independently. That's true on the first day of school. It's true when it's time for the first sleepover with friends. It's certainly true when they pack their bags and head off to college or to begin their life as a young adult. It's hard to let your children go. Mothers, every mother goes through that. I'd like for us to take this opportunity to look at motherhood and the birth of children and the raising of children to talk a little, bit, a little bit about Jesus and the church. In the same way that giving birth was labor, was work, and was great sacrifice, so God was willing to make a sacrifice. The events of Jesus on the cross are beyond our ability to understand it's like a man trying to understand what labor and delivery are like for a woman. None of us can truly understand the extent of the suffering that Jesus endured upon the cross. And when it was all over, what did God have? Sin was forgiven. Judgment was no longer a reality for his children. And now a new relationship was possible between God and all the people of the world. Throughout all the chaos of the cross and the empty tomb, something new had come into existence. For Jesus, through his suffering and death, had given birth to his church. And like a loving parent, he was gentle and patient with his children as they grew. The disciples themselves often didn't understand who they were or what they were to be. And yet Jesus was there for them, patiently guiding them. When they wobbled and stumbled and, and fell, he was there to comfort and assure them. When they didn't know which direction to go, he was present to guide them. When they succeeded in their task and celebrated, his heart rejoiced with them. It is a very unique thing that this is how God patiently and lovingly as our Savior deals with his people, with his children. And like a newborn, he watches over us as we grow from our infancy in the faith to full maturity. And he sees this and, and responds to us in this way, generation after generation of believers, helping us to grow and become everything he desires for us to be, which is a reflection of him in the world. In our text this morning, we have the account of Jesus interacting with some of his disciples text tells us that Peter and Nathaniel and Thomas and James and John and two other disciples are on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now Jesus has appeared to them twice in Jerusalem behind locked doors and he's told them to go to Galilee. They finally heeded his voice and they get to Galilee where they are going to meet him and they're waiting and that's not Peter's strong suit. Peter is often impatient and impetuous. He doesn't know what to do with himself, so he defaults back to his basic understanding of life. He says, I'm going to go fishing. He'd been a fisherman before Jesus called him as, a, as an apostle. The other disciples who were there, not knowing what to do, say, okay, we'll go with you. 
and understand what it was like. This is a man, and as well as some of the others, who made their livelihood off fishing on the Sea of Galilee. They are out all night long, and they catch nothing. A very frustrating night for these men. The day is breaking, and they're heading into shore, and there's a figure standing. They can barely make him out from the light of the new dawn. And he calls to them, Children, do you have any fish? The answer comes back from the boat, no, probably a very frustrated no. The voice from the shore calls out, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Now these guys are in a boat that's not very big. And what in the world, what difference would it make what side of the boat they cast the net? But they do. And immediately it is full of fish. It's John who understands the implications of what's going on at that moment in their life. He looks up at Peter and says, it's the Lord. Peter had not realized, and it had not dawned on him who it was standing on the shore. Peter puts his clothes on and dives into the sea and swims 100 yards to the shore, the rest of the disciples dragging the net as they make their way. Peter walks out of the water dripping wet, and there he is standing face to face with Jesus. The fire is burning, and as the other disciples come up with the boat, dragging the net of fish, Jesus says, come, have some breakfast. You see, Jesus is patiently watching over, like a parent with a young child, nurturing them, helping them to understand who they are to be. Peter and the rest of the disciples don't know what they're supposed to do, even though Jesus had told them. Jesus had told them they would be his witnesses. He had told them that he was going to suffer and die for their sins. He had made it clear, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. He had told them they would be his witnesses throughout the world. They were to go and proclaim forgiveness in his name. And yet they still had not come to the point where they fully understood who they were to be. And so Jesus is patient with them. When he calls out to them, Children, do you have any fish? It was a literal statement, but it was also a message. They were told by Jesus they were to be fishers of men, and yet they hadn't quite grasped what that meant. Following the breakfast, there on the shore, there is a time of instruction, a time of restoration. Jesus begins a conversation with Peter. You heard it in the text. He asks him three times. Peter, do you love me? The first time Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. See, there's a lot to do, a lot involved in leading God's people. He would lead, he would tend, he would feed, he would nurture, he would guide, he would direct. There was a lot involved in what it meant to lead God's people. But what was most important is, Peter, do you love me? See, Jesus wanted to know, in Peter's heart of hearts, does he love Jesus first and foremost above everything else? Because it is only as Peter, it is only as each one of us, love Jesus first and foremost, that we are enabled to love God's people as he desires for us to. Sometimes we don't know what to do. Sometimes we get frustrated. But what is most important is that we love Jesus first. And our love for Jesus is a response of his love for us. You mothers who are listening today, you are in a unique position. You understand that it does not matter the cost. It does not matter the sacrifice. All the labor, all the suffering, all the sacrifice was worth it simply to have your child. You are the closest ones around us, you mothers, who can truly understand the heart of God. There was no sacrifice too great. 
There was no limit to which God would stop in doing what was necessary to love us and have us as his children. And all the suffering, all the heartache, all the pain and anguish that Jesus endured were nothing to be compared to the love and the joy that filled his heart when it, when it became a reality that we could belong to him. Our love for Jesus is a response to his great love for us. In fact, the Apostle Paul says these words. He writes that there is no limit to the amount of love, the sacrifice that Jesus will do for us. No extent, no limit to what God will do to accomplish revealing his love for us. We are to love God first. And then it is as we experience God's love for us and as we love God that we will also experience the joy that fills the heart of God, the joy that filled the heart of Jesus. For having received his love and sharing it with others, we receive the joy of what it means to love other people. And it is as we love other people that lives can truly be transformed. Years ago, there was a fourth grade teacher her name was Miss Thompson. The new school year began, as all school years do, for children in elementary school with great excitement, smiling faces. And Miss Thompson loved the children in her class that particular year, all except for one little boy named Teddy. Teddy was unkept, often dirty and smelly when he came to school. He was ostracized for the most part by the other children. If he had ever had any desire to truly apply himself in his work, it had long since gone. After the first few weeks of school, Ms. Thompson found out that Teddy's mother had died at the end of the previous school year. He would turn in sloppy, half-completed work, and Ms. Thompson just simply kind of tolerated him. She would be a buffer when the other kids teased him, but she really didn't know what to do. She just let him be there in her class, and he fell further and further behind as the year progressed. As I made it through the first half of the year and Christmas came, it was time for the annual Christmas party, and they had cookies and cupcakes, and all the children brought beautifully wrapped presents and put them on Miss Thompson's desk. Teddy brought a gift, too, but his was in a brown paper bag. The other children laughed at him. He went to the back of the room and sat in his chair at his desk and hung his head. When the party was about over and it came time to open the gifts, Miss Thompson would open each gift and ooh and ah and thank the child who brought her the gift, and finally she came to Teddy's brown paper bag. She opened it up and she reached inside and pulled out a, 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 a rhinestone bracelet with many of the stones missing and a half-used bottle of perfume. The other children laughed. Ms. Thompson, seeing and realizing what was going on, quickly put the bracelet on her wrist and sprayed some of the perfume on herself and thanked Teddy profusely for the gift. The day was ended and, and Christmas break was at hand and the kids filed out of the classroom with smiles on their faces and Teddy quietly gathered his things and made his way to the front of the room. And he stopped at Ms. Thompson's desk and he said, I'm glad you like the gift I got you. And Ms. Thompson, you sure do smell like my mama. And he left the room. And in that moment, the realization hit that little Teddy had brought what had belonged to his mother, who had passed away, as a gift for Ms. Thompson for Christmas. Alone in her room, tears welled up in Ms. Thompson's eyes, and she cried out to God for forgiveness, for not truly loving Teddy as she should have for not encouraging him and working with him. And she not only asked God for forgiveness, but she cried out to God for the strength and the wisdom to be a good teacher to Teddy. When Christmas break was over, Ms. Thompson started working with the young boy. And by the end of the school year, he had almost caught up with his classmates. And they had a good relationship together. She didn't see Teddy very much after that in the hallways as he went through fifth and sixth grade. And she lost track with him, of him. A few years later, she received a letter. She said, Dear Miss Thompson, I want you to be the first to know. They just told me I'm graduating second in my high school class. 
thank you, love, Teddy. She smiled and it warmed her heart and she put the letter in her desk and went on her way. Four years later, she received another letter that said, Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me I'm graduating top of my class, the first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know. The university's been a challenge, but I have loved it. Thank you, love, Teddy. It warmed her heart to think that this little boy who struggled so much with grief and isolation and aloneness had accomplished so much. Four years later, Ms. Thompson received yet another letter. It opened like this, Dear Ms. Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, M.D. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. She was amazed. She was amazed that this little scruffy, dirty boy had accomplished so much. And then just a few weeks later, she received a fourth letter. It was really more of an invitation with a note. It said, Dear Miss Thompson, enclosed is an invitation to my wedding. I would like for you to come and sit where my mother would have sat if she was alive. My father passed away last year, and you're the only family I have left. Ms. Thompson went to the wedding, sat where Teddy's mother would have sat, smiled and celebrated, finally realizing the role she played, that a simple word of encouragement a simple act of love could literally change a person's life forever. As we live in this world as God's people, as we live as those whom Jesus says to us, do you love me? It is as we love Jesus, first and foremost in our lives, that we can truly then turn and love others around us. We'll never see a hurting child a young couple who's struggling, an elderly person who is lonely. We'll never see them the same. But we will understand that it is our call to love them and to, experience, and to experience the joy that can fill our hearts as we are a source of encouragement to them in their lives. It's what it means to be a reflection of Jesus to the world. It's what it means to love Jesus first and to love others. It means being the church. The church that Jesus, through his suffering and death and resurrection, has given birth to. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.